allergicliving.com has become a go-to resource for the latest allergy news. As an individual who lives with multiple food allergies and has experienced anaphylaxis, Gwen's interest in the area is personal as well as professional. Prior to Allergic Living, Gwen worked as an editor for a major women's magazine and she has a newspaper background. She brings a journalist's eye for personal stories and investigative reporting to allergy topics. I'm very excited to have Gwen here to present to you today and at this time I will turn the webinar over to her. Christy, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm uh, very thankful to you and, and uh, Lynn Hewn and Fair for inviting me to present on the topic of adult onset allergies. Um, I think while it's only natural with the epidemic of food allergies in children that a lot of the food allergy focuses on kids, but I think it's also really important uh, that we as a community try to understand why these allergies are also developing later in people's lives from their 20s and 30s, sometimes right up into to their 80s. Um, and then we need to know, as adults, how do we live well with this condition? So, um, and, it's, uh, and I'd also say welcome to everybody who's tuned in, and I, I hope that we have some of you among us who have uh, adult food allergies, and some of you may have children with food allergies and may just be interested as well, but uh, I hope we have a nice mixed group of people here. Um, as Christy mentions, I do uh, know food allergies firsthand, uh, as I'm not just the editor of an allergy magazine. In a way, I'm part of the audience, too. Um, so uh, without further ado, I thought I would just uh, quickly um, mention a few of the things, uh, the outline of some of the things we'll cover in this presentation. Um, I want to give you a few of the adult onset facts. I um, want to speak a little bit about my own experiences. Um, obviously, Allergic Living has done a fair bit of reporting on this area as well, so I'll weave in a few of those uh, facts. And I want to talk a bit about um, adapting to this diagnosis because there can be a whole range, you'll see that there can be a real dichotomy between people reacting in a very fearful way to suddenly having the diagnosis to a sort of denial and then where we like people to reach is uh, a nicer place of balance. Um, there are many challenges when you're diagnosed as an adult with IgE food allergies from social to workplace to going out to restaurants and then I will speak a little bit about the importance of self-care and your attitude. So let me start with my uh, personal experience. Um, my food allergy story kind of begins I guess in the mid-1990s uh, there's a nice picture of Florida there because I was living in Tampa, Florida as a 30-year-old newspaper editor. And then one evening, I decided to make myself a supper of garlic fried shrimp and a salad. Just a short while later, suddenly I'm feeling nauseated. And what was really strange was I was feeling itchy. So I take myself off to look in the mirror, and I was absolutely shocked. My skin looked red, there were hives breaking out on my face and chest. So I didn't know about food allergies. Even though I'd had uh, allergies to many pollens and dust mites, I really knew next to nothing about food allergies at this point. Um, I think I'd vaguely heard of an EpiPen, but I sure didn't own one. Um, so I called a good friend close by who said, we're going to hospital. So off we went to Tampa General in her little sports car. Now, to make this uh, what could be a long story short, uh, my reaction quickly became anaphylaxis and it was bad. Within the minutes it took to get to hospital, I was doubling over with stomach cramps. Uh, apparently at the ER they told me later that my blood pressure had plummeted. I felt a bit faint. Um, but what I recall the most about that reaction, and I recall it to this day, was that feeling that I couldn't get my breath. I was, it was, I was breathing in asthmatic wheezes, and that was the scariest part, trying to breathe. It was kind of like when you can't get your breath underwater, only there was no water. So uh, I don't think it's uh, too dramatic to say that epinephrine, and I was uh, given a lot of it, uh, was my real lifesaver that day. Um, but... To, to mention epinephrine, I, I would like to just uh, mention for those who have uh, not needed to use it to date that 
I would say a lesson from having to use it even early on for me was that it was well worth the needle. Um, the symptoms abated very quickly when I was given enough, and that was really good news. Um, anyway, uh, just to scroll along in, in my own story, the ER doctors thought this was a clear case of anaphylaxis. I did follow up. I would remind you here that I'm talking about the 1990s. There was low awareness. There was no labeling on food products. No talk of cross-contact. No one ever mentioned that to me. So this was a risky time. I think the one fortunate thing for me was that it was shellfish and you didn't encounter it. As It was a little easier to avoid than perhaps some allergens. But what I should mention about shellfish is that um, it turns out it's really common in people with um, adult allergies. Not many people knew, though, for a long time that it was common. So then in, uh, it wasn't until 2004 when we get the first big study that reveals the true size of seafood allergy. It was 2% of American households out of this big survey that uh, Fair and Mount Sinai uh, undertook. In fact, it seems so odd uh, that I remember uh, speaking uh, to one of the authors uh, not long after, once we'd started the magazine. I should remind you, in 2004, we hadn't even started the magazine, but they were so um, perplexed by this data that they actually reviewed it all. But it turned out, yes, it was not only real, but it was an adult phenomenon. In fact, when you teased the children out of the study, 2.8% of adults were allergic to a form of seafood, either shellfish or fish, but shellfish was by far the bigger. And again, just a little side point here that uh, more studies have proved that since. So it's, uh, it's definitely seen quite widely. Now, just to not to belabor my personal experience, but I'm not just allergic to shellfish. So we have fireworks down below here because it was the, the 4th of July, 2004, that I again experienced anaphylaxis. Um, again, to my own cooking. Yes, you might think I had it in for myself. Um, it was a reaction to a store-bought satay sauce. And we all know what's in satay sauce, peanut. In fact, peanut wasn't something I even liked that much. And satay sauce wasn't something I commonly made. But it was a sauce on a chicken dish. So um, when I first uh, had this reaction, I didn't even realize that it was a reaction. Nobody else was sick. I thought I had the flu, went to bed, and then woke up covered in hives and struggling to breathe. And fortunately, this time, I had an EpiPen. So uh, that, that went a little better. But what was confusing here for me, and this isn't an uncommon story for many adults, the reactions continued to occur. So I had many small and bigger reactions. So uh, something was going on. I had another appointment coming up with the allergist. In the, in the meantime, my uh, family doctor took me down to basic chicken and rice. And then she'd say, OK, you're OK with that. Now add a vegetable. You're OK with that. Now you can add. What is something like fit? I share. I cut the soy out, the mystery hives, and other symptoms. Right away, I had to learn about grocery labels, which I really didn't follow. And I think I'm not trying to say that. <laughs> I'm not by nature a stupid person, but I think my case is not unusual. When you don't read labels all the time, if you talk to people who live without food allergies, they don't really get what's in packaged food. You know, they might be reading for sugar content or this or that. But you know, until you come to really understand what label reading is about, um, you may miss 
uh, a lot of foods, uh, particularly, um, I mentioned, uh, you know, things like soy, dairy, and wheat. You know, at first when I had soy allergy, I thought, oh, well, there goes Asian food. Little did I know it's a big emulsifier. Um, you know, it's in the vast majority of the packaged goods. So there was a big learning curve in terms of what to avoid. And that's true of a number of allergens. Uh, food labeling laws had just passed. Uh, allergen labeling was just starting to be reliable. So it was uh, a different time. We forget sometimes that really we've only had these things in place for a decade. So allergic living has done um, a number of, uh, well, a few anyway, uh, stories on adult allergies. And they've been illuminating. Um, you definitely see that it's extremely confusing to have eaten a food like shellfish or nuts without issue one day, and the next, boom, you've got a big reaction. Um, in this, the uh, anecdotal stories we did with, uh, with various um, adult onset people, you, you really do hear about stories of uh, relearning how to shop and to eat and kind of coming to terms with a, a really important fact, I think, for, um, for adults, and that is what we eat is complex. In fact, it took a phone call to the former fan for me to realize when I was in that period where I hadn't seen the allergist, I called them up and said, what could be going on? Here's what I'm eating. And I would give an example of something like a beef stew or a quesadilla. And you know, you just don't think of the myriad ingredients that are in these things until you have to stop and step back. I mean, a quesadilla, you know, you've got everything from the shell to what's inside. You know, where was it? Was it homemade or who made it? You know, if it's a packaged good. Problem for people when they there's come to a universe grips with, and that is just we don't eat one little food with an, uh, with a spice on it. We've usually got several things. Um, so adult onset, are we seeing that? This seems to be you know sort of the million dollar question. There's not a lot of research on it uh, yet. Um, if you think about it, in kids, food allergies are an issue with the immune system not properly switching over. Um, to the uh, Th1 fighting mode that you know is meant to fight bacteria. So what's going on with adults that we can actually gain food allergies? Now we do know that five percent of adults in the U.S. have food allergies versus eight percent. That's something we've kind of learned out of the surveys. But then helpfully in August 2014, Northwestern University researchers shed some light. Uh, with prevalence and characteristics of adult onset food allergy. This is a really good little study. Um, they assessed the records of over a thousand adult food allergy patients and they discovered that at least 15% of them had confirmed IgE food allergies diagnosed over the age of 18. What's interesting is you of uh, ages right up to age 86 and right down to 18, but most patients have their first adult onset reaction in their 30s. And more women than men have adult food allergies. That's the opposite to children. Um, other allergic disease is also important. If you have hay fever or eczema, these are associated with an increased risk of developing an adult food allergy. Um, the, one of the authors on the study, Dr. Paul Bryce, uh, made an interesting point. He said, again, that with children, it may be they fail to develop a tolerance to the foods they're encountering earlier in life. But with adults, he says, we think it's something very different, that they're actually losing the tolerance to foods they've already been able to, to eat and been exposed to. So I think that's quite an interesting point. Um, and something that you know may be illuminating as we go along and, and look for more um, understanding of this topic. Now, the Northwestern study, once again, big triggers were shellfish, and I, I don't think I mentioned earlier, but tree nuts has always historically been a big one for adult onset allergies too. But in this study, what's interesting is all top eight allergens were observed in adults. 
Um, and the five most common among the 171 that they said definitely were IgE uh, mediated allergies, shellfish 54%, you can see how big these are. But look at this, soy 13%, even ahead of, of peanuts and uh, uh, I hope there's a fellow all of others actually wrote me when, when uh, we said we were doing this uh, webinar and they're talking about uh, soy onset allergies. Uh, it's not that uncommon to hear about. What's surprising is we're even seeing things in the study like adult onset milk allergy. Usually in adults they only talk about dairy intolerance, but this was actual IgE allergy. Uh, one of the other study authors is Dr. Rushi Gupta. Um, I think uh, many of you will know uh, Dr. Gupta from her uh, population studies. So she told Allergic Living, we interviewed her about this study, that her big question is what triggers someone to lose uh, tolerance to a food in adulthood? Some of the things she's pondering, uh, something in the person's environment, maybe a change in that environment. Sometimes there's talk among allergists of if we move, does that give our exposures, you know, perhaps to different pollens, different levels of dust mite, um, a relationship to infection or virus, that's also a possibility. Um, what's interesting is Dr. Gupta says she's involved in a big research study with Stanford uh, to try to get further along on this question. So. I hope we, we will see some answers forthcoming. I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, of course, you can expect Allergic Living to cover that when we know something more. Um, now, just uh, one of the people who wrote in about the webinar uh, was an older patient. And there are a couple of things to consider um, in older patients with allergies. The Northwestern study found uh, that some of the reactions, some of the uh, more likely to be anaphylaxis occurring in seniors. And they thought that perhaps that was due to other conditions uh, such as heart conditions related to uh, cardiovascular disease, um, perhaps uh, worsening the actual symptoms. There's another issue, and I don't know if everyone's aware of this or not, but they've said for a long time, the experts, that there could be a contraindication with epinephrine if you're on beta blockers. Um, and so that usually, if you know you have heart disease and you have an adult onset allergy, they'll tell you uh, to try to use uh, you know, speak to your doctor about using um, a different form of medication. However, I would just like to point out, I've got a little study reference here. Uh, uh, leading experts, uh, Dr. Phil Lieberman and Dr. Estelle Simons, just last year, did do um, a piece of research on this question uh, about beta blockers, and they are saying you know, that while they said that concerns about potential adverse effects need to be weighed against concerns about possible death from untreated anaphylaxis. So, but if you don't know that you have the food allergy and it's a sudden, you know, suddenly you're in anaphylaxis, it is helpful to know that Lieberman and Simon say, and this is a quote, there is no absolute contrary indication to epinephrine injection and anaphylaxis. So that's new and that's worth knowing about. Again, I sort of look at it as the food allergy community helping to share, you know, through these webinars information that we all come across. Um, you know, it might not be you, but maybe someone else you know is in that situation. I hope, God forbid you not see someone in that situation, but it is always possible. I do have a prediction. One of the interest areas I have is hospital food, because as we grow older as a population and food allergies continue to rise as an adult uh, issue, um, we need to have more precautions in those hospitals about cross-contact and uh, Feel free to write us at editor at allergicliving.com if you hear any stories on this because I am very interested in the hospital's issue. But now I'd like to move along, if we could, to the actual challenges that we face um, as adults with food allergies. And I would say that it missed symptoms. You know, it's really easy to miss that you're having a reaction. It was only for me with hindsight that I realized other times I've been sick to my stomach or had GI problems, that was probably a reaction to soy. But 
or peanut, but I didn't really realize it because it wasn't that strong. It's easy to mistake gut symptoms for the flu or food poisoning. Um, another time uh, I spoke to Dr. Estelle Simons and she says from her studies that only uh, there are 10% of people who will not get hives in anaphylaxis. Hives are actually rather helpful. They help us identify that it's, it's food allergy, but it might not always happen. So, you know, share that news with adults who might be having symptoms that sound suspicious and they should get to an allergist. Now, now also think of how we live compared to children. Adults are busy, we're working, we're organizing families. Do we pay close enough attention to our symptoms? Come on, how many people go to go to work when they should be home with a flu or something? They, you know, it happens all the time. But you may miss that mild symptoms are actually a relationship to food, that the, that the symptoms are coming on after eating. So I'd almost put out a question to the group to say to those of you who have adult onset allergies, was the first big reaction you had really your first reaction? Or did you maybe mix, mistake or ignore earlier symptoms? And I'm suspicious that probably we'd find a majority of people would say that they, they did miss things. Now, I'd also like to talk a little bit about um, how people respond and how they adapt to the diagnosis. Some people become very fearful, especially if you've had anaphylaxis. It's a life changer, let's face it. Um, and that can be followed by weight loss, fear of dining, little of loss of control. That's not uncommon. Now, in a minority, a bit of a sense of adult cases, but again, you can watch for it with friends, sometimes people might go beyond uh, simple need for precaution, even once they've got uh, the allergy rules down and they're reading their labels and everything. So there might be a time where for somebody they might need a little bit of uh, psychological help. It does take a toll. Uh, anaphylaxis can be compared to a form of post-traumatic syndrome in some situations. So uh, not surprising that there's, there's that fear out there. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, unfortunately the flip side of this is that you know, some people might get too fearful. Then we've got the people who are too cavalier. I bet everybody on this call knows somebody who has a food allergy as an adult and does not carry up an effort, does not speak to waiters. I'll change it. Um, but there's, this is born of a lack of education about complete allergen avoidance. They don't get cross-contact. They may not follow what's meant about may contains, and it is too cavalier. Um, I give one example of a 2009 survey of um, uh, University of Michigan students with food allergies. Only 21% of study participants owned an auto injector. It's not just students. Um, you know, the, this is fairly typical of this, this story we did down here, the allergy deniers. Uh, you know, a fellow saying, I try not to take my nut allergy too seriously, otherwise it would drive me and everyone else crazy. Well, I'm sorry, you're driving me crazy with that answer, mister, but you know, that's, that's what we hear. So, it's not uncommon, unfortunately. So, I think that what we need to do is get to a place where we do find our own comfort level and self-care. I, I think it's really so important to adjust to the fact that food allergy, it, it's, it's not something that means you're weak in some fashion or less than someone else. It's a chronic and legitimate disease. I don't know if I could say that. I, I mean, I, there's one message you take from this. I hope that you carry that out to people who, you know, aren't taking enough care of their, their uh, adult food allergies. You need to respect it at all times uh, and there's, there's no, you know, there, there are no days off for food allergies, unfortunately, um, but we can learn to live well with it. Try to find that place of balance between precaution and fear and denial. You know, the biggest thing I hear from uh, younger people in their 20s and 30s at, at, is that they are embarrassed about, uh, you know, at first you do tend to feel like a burden to others, for instance, as a dinner guest. 
you need to get past this. Again, it's a legitimate health issue. You're going as a dinner guest, I say have an email ready that will, you know, cover off, uh, you know, some of the ingredients you're in avoiding, but also give uh, somebody an idea of some of the foods that go into things. Review the menu with them. You can do it in a nice, upbeat way. Do it in plenty of time. Uh, it is workable. I can tell you from experience. I do it all the time. Now at work, um, we also hear things where people don't want to talk to their boss or whatever. They don't want to look like they're somehow, one person said to me, and I hate that term, damaged goods. I'm like, no, you're not. You're not. Um, but it's just mention because it is helpful for people to know, your boss, your colleagues, you now have them, you've just maybe had anaphylaxis and you've just been diagnosed with adult onset tree nut allergy. You have a medically required diet, but you know, frame it in a positive way. Maybe you could look after booking the next uh, group lunch that's going to be done at a restaurant. There are events with food. The best thing you can do is get on the planning committee. You may not have a lot of time, but you know, pick your spots. If it's one you really want to eat at, help out with that one. Um, don't put it all at somebody else's door. Uh, do some of the work yourself, and you'll be the better for it. Now, one of the big challenges, though, let's face it, is trying to explain to family and friends. They've seen you eating the food that you're now allergic to before. It's very bizarre to them. It was bizarre to you. It's bizarre to them. So you have to try to, um, you know, and you have to try to explain to them in a way that is simple at first and then more complicated. You may not be able to eat at their homes right away. It may, may be a learning curve. Initially, I even got from my own sister, can't you pick the shrimp out of the noodles? We'd like to order Thai. No, where do you start? Now she's one of my best allies, but it did take a while. Um, see that lovely dessert down there? People will say, who would put soy in a dessert? And you know, you just have to say, no thanks. If you don't want to mention that it's an allergy at that particular moment, maybe you're at a business lunch or something, just say not for me and move along and educate later. Um, but we also have to be a bit patient, especially with uh, those who are our loved ones. There's a learning curve for all of us, and those who care for you do tend to come around. It just it does take a little while and a little repetition uh, and a few emails. And they, when you keep saying no to, to their fancy cakes, uh, they, they start to get them the idea or they start to make them allergy safe. So that's, uh, that's what happens. Um, one of the issues is they haven't seen the reaction in most cases. If they do, they take you seriously. So as an adult, you have to really relearn your relationship with food. Again, um, you know, what we eat is complicated. Uh, to me, the things that are a bit of minefields of ingredients are things like sauces, salad dressings, and desserts. If you're eating at a restaurant, maybe avoid those. Uh, you know, are you going to know completely what's in them? A salad, ask for oil and vinegar. You know, it's it's always available. Have a safe snack in a handbag or office drawer. Don't be tempted by, um, you know, the uh, somebody's bringing around some cupcakes or whatever. You don't have to give in to that. You've got your own snack. You're not going to be brought over by something that's too tempting. Really important to build a cooking repertoire of shortcuts and frozen snacks. I think we can learn a lot from the allergy moms who are amazing at, you know, having that frozen dessert or, or that little meal that, you know, um, a friend of mine says she just, uh, she cooks in triple courses and then freezes. So, you know, for those times when you're really going to be busy, you have things available. It's, really great to do that and make your life a little simpler. It doesn't have to be as hard as it can seem at first. The good news is you do eat healthier. I mean, we don't really realize what's in a lot of the packaged goods until we start reading those labels. And then we're like, okay, well, my allergen's not there, but what is, you know, xyla something at all, you know, and you sort of realize, gee, I'm not sure I'm going to get to my children. Um, with relearning dining out, uh, there, the good news is there really are a lot of great resources now. And I want to point out uh, the cover that we did 
from uh, Last Mining Guide. That's Chef Meta in New York City, who's a fantastic uh, allergy-friendly, celiac-friendly chef. Um, and it was so wonderful to me to find all these restaurants that really were going the distance for people. If we if we tried doing this guide in 2005, it would have been a very short list. But now we actually had our pick of places and, and you know, really picked the, the best we could find. So there's resources like that uh, with our site. Uh, FAIR is doing some wonderful work uh, with a program to train restaurants in partnership with the National Restaurant Association and Menu Trinfo, who have long been uh, allergy trainers. Allergy Eats, I think a number of you in this community review good chain restaurants uh, reviews in particular in there but um, you know sometimes it might use it's a lot of skew a little bit more on restaurants all they do is add a review um, allergy But a chef card, you can put some of the details down so that uh, the manager and maybe the chef ahead of time of going to a restaurant. Again, so they can take it directly into the kitchen. Helpful to have. I can't recall, but it has uh, chef cards as well. Um, I, I mentioned this, I think, in passing, but if you're going to a friend's dinner party, again, you're a valued guest. You're not an embarrassment or a difficulty. All that's going to be your go-to about your food allergies and um, and try to help out and have people over to your house too. That's that's always a good way to way to go. Um, just quickly, a couple of other factors that uh, I'm talking here largely about IgE-mediated allergies. Uh, there is still a fair bit of oral allergy syndrome. In fact, I should rephrase that. There's uh, quite a lot of adult onset allergy is oral allergy syndrome, not surprisingly because it's about 10% uh, of the population generally who has it. Um, so if you know someone who's getting symptoms and they're more related to the itchy mouth or uh, and it's around vegetables, for instance, it may be this cross-reaction uh, syndrome that relates to pollen allergies. Um, it may or may not require carrying epinephrine. There are definitely differing degrees of how serious that can be. It's important also, I, I think increasingly we should be talking about cofactors. This is um, this area. This, um, this is not uh, that common, but for some individuals who are at risk of eight mast cells and make an allergic reaction more intense. So something that might have been a milder reaction in the face of you then exercising as I might add I did with shrimp uh, uh, because it was the 90s and I had to do my aerobics after. But such as aspirin or naproxen, depending on the person, even premenopausal food or a reaction is worse. So it's important to know about those things. I wouldn't stress over them, but if you are suspicious, Maybe talk to your doctor about it and, and see um, you know, if that is a factor in your life. Uh, they are uh, there. It's not as common as just the basic IgE food allergy, but it does occur. So I just want to, uh, you know, I'm getting close to uh, wrapping this up and we can move along to some questions. I'd love to hear from some of you people uh, with your own experiences. Um, but a few tips for uh, life with adult onset allergies. Remember the Girl Scout motto, be prepared. And I would say number two is pretty obvious. Spontaneity isn't your friend if it involves food. Um, 
spontaneity may not be your friend even you know if you're looking to travel make sure that you're not too far from an emergency clinic or hospital you know check those things out you have to do a lot of preparing always have a safe snack uh, a line I used to give reporters in a big newsroom was that assumption is the mother of all screw-ups because it is so somebody says oh yeah that cake's got to be okay that lovely chocolate cake we saw before don't don't buy into it just say yeah yeah well no thanks I if I if I don't have a way to check it I, I don't know and another way to resist tempting food because like who doesn't like good food is to ask yourself how badly do I want to go to the ER today it's a really good question it has a tendency to take away that temptation um, carrier epinephrine um, I'm really a stickler about this I always have mine because I've had bad reactions I don't want to die over a food I want to be ready so if you forgot it then you're not eating get past the embarrassment again legitimate health condition and when you're avoiding that's just managing it so take charge of your condition and speak hands you've got to do it um, you know if you're not comfortable with what's being served just don't eat it's only food you can eat later and um, be kind to yourself I think it's the difficult disease to uh, have to adapt to it's quite manageable but there are some things that go along with it but I really really like to live a good and full life and I, I don't like to see people missing out so I hope that uh, I hope that that's uh, a game plan that you try to follow as well. Um, I wanted to say thank you so much to both FAIR for presenting this um, and also just to all of you for, uh, you know, been so supportive of us at Allergic Living and the work that we do and for coming to this, uh, this session. And we've uh, added a few um, uh, resources here and uh, have a look I think you'll find some of them quite helpful and uh, with that ado I will uh, sort of hand it back over to Christy to see if there are any questions thank you Gwen at this time we'll address a few questions that came in a couple questions have come through one from someone an adult initially diagnosed with a peanut and tree nut allergy and another with a weed allergy they're interested in better understanding the fact that over the span of a few years, the number of allergies they've developed has been increasing significantly. What are some questions that would be good to ask their allergist as they work to manage those allergies? And is there any general information that might shed some light on their situations? Just to understand, so that they're, they're, these are separate people. Somebody was peanut and tree nut and the other person was wheat? Yes, that have yes. been developing additional allergies increasingly over the years increasingly see increasingly makes me think that you're getting more and more I, th I, th I think the truth of the matter is again it comes back to there's not a lot of research a lot of understanding on the why of it um, they're still trying to investigate you know the the what is triggering this to come on um, I think that the it's not that common uh, again we don't have full research but to hear of people um, getting more and more allergic usually you get one maybe two I don't think you want to assume that you're going because you you did develop one or two but I think you can just uh, be very mindful of symptoms you do see you know after food and you know if you do think you're developing things maybe keep a symptom like a diary of when you're noticing symptoms and then you know go and talk to uh, your GP or your allergist and you know is it time to try eliminating a food and seeing if that makes a difference is it time for food allergy testing is there enough there but as a general rule I wouldn't say they see a ton of you know uh, people gaining more and more it tends to be you know it's in my case I have three but you know I I don't even hear that many people who have as many as that thank you another question came in um, they're looking for recommendations for handing in, handling an allergy to corn which isn't considered a common allergen but is commonly used in manufacturing it is um, I think that the it is it is difficult when you're dealing with one of the allergens and it's not just corn it could be 
uh, many different things that, uh, you know, they just don't label fully all ingredients. Uh, I wish they did. Uh, corn is a tough one because it's used very widely in foods. Um, I think that you have to uh, look up some, there are a fair number of uh, corn allergy sites around. I would get familiar with uh, some of the uh, foods that you really need to avoid. Uh, packaged foods are going to be more difficult for you with a corn allergy, so I would uh, tend to go in that in that uh, way of, of trying to eat fresh as much as I could. Great. Thank you very much. And that actually answered kind of our next question, which was uh, any general recommendations for managing less common allergens that aren't necessarily on the label? Well, I think that is what you have to do um, is, I mean, that is, I appreciate that it can be difficult, but you kind of have to look at it and say, look, all vegetables and meat can still be pretty much open to, depending on, you know, I mean, if it's something like red pepper or something, that one's out. Um, I think another thing is sometimes, uh, for instance, uh, we see this a lot with oral allergy sy uh, syndrome, but there can be cross-reactivity among some foods. So you might want to become familiar with that. Uh, some people with uh, cashew allergy, for instance, might be allergic to mango. Not always, but there is a cross-reactivity there. So you might be, want to become aware of our, you know, what are the food families and are there any particularly allergenic foods uh, in, in, you know, in the group that, that you now uh, are, are avoiding, so, or it, you know, the one allergen that you're avoiding, but what's, what family is it in and are there particularly allergenic foods? That would seem Great. something else to do. Great, thank you. Um, another question, do you have any recommendations for shopping for cosmetics, especially considering that they don't necessarily have to be labeled the same way that foods do? They don't, but there are more good brands uh, coming out all the time. Um, and uh, I know we cover beauty in the magazine for that very reason, but it is a, one of the reasons we do that is to sort of try to almost curate for people, you know, to find these products and to find what they're free of. And we check with the companies, so we do a bit of the legwork on that. But other than that, you do have to do your own uh, legwork um, not everybody will react as a skin contact, but I think a lot of us prefer to avoid uh, our allergen. There are some good brands, something like an Alme or a Clinique. Those tend to be uh, free from brands, so good to know of. Great, thank you. Um, we did get a question about from someone with a shrimp allergy and beta blockers. They're just interested in if you can go back and just restate what the study was that you covered on the, the beta blockers and epinephrine. Okay, that study was, um, I can try to find the slide for you because I don't think I have that otherwise uh, other than on the slide. Um, oops, is that it? Yes. Okay. So it is out of, uh, it was Lieberman and Simons, and it was called Anaphylaxis and Cardiovascular Disease Therapeutic Dilemma. It was published in Clinical and Experimental Allergy in July 2015. And I, I think that was the detail that the person was after, but again, what they're talking about there is that, and I did find that interesting, that you know, while we generally say avoid, uh, most of the uh, allergists will say avoid uh, beta blockers, um, that they're saying that in the case of anaphylaxis that was unknown anaphylaxis suddenly cropping up in someone using it, that it would still be safer than having the anaphylaxis risk to use it. So that was their advice. Great, thank you. And just a reminder to everyone that the slides will be up on our website um, within a couple of weeks after this. So if you want to go back and reference any of the studies, that will be available for you. Um, another question from someone who's wondering if you have any facts or tips to help encourage people to carry the two-pack of epinephrine rather than just carrying around the one. Well, I just think that if you've had anaphylaxis and you know that there are risks, um, they say it's up to as much as 20%. Uh, for biphasic reaction that you might need a second shot, um, that you don't want to take that chance. I mean, it, it can take time, depending on where you are, to get to an ambulance, to get to a hospital, and it would be better if you can treat it immediately. Um, you mean that just the, res do you think the person means the resistance sometimes to carrying two of them? Is that what the issue is? 
Uh, she has a sister that she's concerned about. Right. Okay. And this this does come up a lot. Um, I think particularly with women, you know, get a nice bag or something that you're used to just, uh, you know, or a little insert to your purse that you're used to putting them in like a little epi bag or something and uh, try to encourage people other than to say, you know, you are at risk of, you might need the second shot is, you know, certainly uh, beats being in a crisis. Uh, you sometimes have to get a little dramatic with people because they can take it a bit too cavalierly. It's pretty common. We run into a lot of issues, particularly with um, guys not wanting to carry it, you know, and when we did that allergy deniers uh, article, we had, I can still remember one guy saying, well, I think it's in my drawer somewhere. You know, and you're thinking, like, how expired is it? But, uh, you know, we just have to, I think it's one of the things that as a community, um, we really can help, you know, if we just, you know, keep encouraging this because uh, I do think there's a lot of noncompliance with adults. Um, do you have any tips or um, ideas for how you could support a family member who has adult onset uh, food allergies and is recently diagnosed? Well, I think that if you're really aware, I think one of the first things is the understanding grocery labels. Because I don't think most of us get much, uh, you know, when at the time I was diagnosed, for instance, uh, I mean, awareness has gotten a lot better. But, you know, people didn't generally talk to you about, uh, okay, here's what to do now, uh, uh, now that you have this, um, this allergy. And I think that, you know, the advice they'll be getting from the doctor probably deals with how to deal with if you get an anaphylactic reaction, etc. And there's a lot to communicate in terms of what to do with your epinephrine. But I think a really helpful place for the person new to the allergy um, is to make sure that they're in that spot of cautious enough but not too fearful to try to help them get there. You know, tell them about the grocery rules and that it's not that hard to read a label for your allergens and to try to, um, you know, cook fresh things, cook and freeze is, you know, again, I think that's a really helpful thing to do so that you don't have to feel like, oh, I used to just be able to do takeout. Now that's off, off limits. So, you know, that, you know, help them find those ways to make their lives easier too. Great, thank you. Um, we also got a question from someone who's tested positive with a skin test to a couple of allergens but hasn't really been experiencing any reactions to them. Do you have any thoughts about how to handle that um, and, and you know how cautious they should be with that? I would, look, if you skin tested positive with an allergist, I would definitely, but you seem to be able to continue to eat the food. You know, most allergists would say then that was probably a false positive, but I personally don't like to be uh, that sure of it. I'd rather talk to an allergist because I'm not an allergist uh, and say, should I be doing an oral food challenge? I would be more comfortable. I, I did one with peanut after I skin test positive only mildly, um, but I failed. Uh, I may take a little more dose of peanut, more amount than some, you know, somebody who's going to react to even a speck. But I did not make it through a quarter of a Reese's uh, peanut thing uh, until I eat them a lot. <laughs> I don't remember what they're called. But uh, anyway, but my point would be, no, it, I did turn out to be genuinely allergic. So, you know, there can be with allergies, sometimes uh, someone won't react to a small amount, but you need to know if you are allergic or not. So I think it would be probably helpful to ask about that. Great, thank you. Um, and as someone was looking for just, are they interested in hearing more personal stories from adults with food allergies? Do you have any suggestions for resources that they could um, get in touch with that? Hmm. Uh, I think there are some uh, sites. I mean, we certainly on our Facebook page, and I'm not <laughs> sure if on Fair, but we we have a lot of people talking to us about uh, adult stories. I. You know, I'd be uh, happy to look up. I think there are a couple of forums, and there are probably some Facebook pages. Um, I just don't have them off the top of my head. Uh, FAIR actually does. On our website, we have a support group directory, and there is one, um, one that's a virtual support group for adults with food allergies, so that is available Perfect. as well. Yeah. 
Um, and then I think our final question here, do you have any additional information about, sorry, EOE related allergies that you can share? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yes, and that's one I didn't. I I'll, if if I was I was afraid I might run too long, so I didn't throw it in on the other types of allergies. But they actually do find that uh, some adults are susceptible to uh, EOE, um, and if I think most people know that that's the uh, food allergy that that is impacted by the eosinophils in the in the esophagus, it can be elsewhere, but EOE is the esophagus one, and it can lead to food impaction, and uh, you know, it is a reaction to specific food triggers. Um, definitely, if you think you might have that, or if you've been diagnosed with that, uh, you need to watch out for uh, gastroenterologists and uh, allergists as well, their, their details on that. I know we do have quite a bit of information on our site about EOE. I, I'm trying to remember. Uh, oh, uh, trying to remember the center um, that Dr. Mark Rothenberg's with. I think it's Cincinnati. Uh, they have a, a very good site with a lot of information about um, EOE, including adult EOE, on that site. He's one of the leaders in this area. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we're, we're just going to drop in one more question here. Do you have any thoughts um, or information about the may contain label statements? Well, the may contains, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because we all know that sometimes you're seeing companies just sort of slap them on and it seems like something that's to do with liability. But then the other information I can give you is that in the testing that's been done by people like Dr. Steve Taylor and Dr. Uh, Scott Sassure, they have found a high proportion of the foods that do say may contain uh, actually containing uh, the food. So um, I think we'd all like to see uh, precautionary labeling being required rather than, you know, like in terms of if, if there's suspicion that there's a uh, um, you know, that there could be cross-contact, then we'd like to see that on labels, but that's still something uh, that, as FAIR would well know, is uh, is still uh, in progress, and in the meantime, uh, we just have to, you know, because it's, it's done um, not on a required basis. Um, I think that you are wise if you're not sure, if you're suspicious that something might contain something and there isn't a may contain precautionary warning on the label, I would phone the company. I do find that companies are much better now about detailing that information because they don't want someone to be sick. They do not want to recall. Great. Thank you. And we just had one question about what EOE stands for. Um, that is eosinophilic esophagitis. Quite That's a mouthful. True. Yeah, it is. And it's different from, it's not an IgE related food allergy, but it's, uh, it's, it's just something that is a different form of food allergy um, that has emerged uh, really in the past few years that there's, uh, you know, much more research and more understanding of it. Um, but you're not going to get anaphylaxis with it, but you could get quite sick with it. And it, it does uh, it can be affected by various food triggers, and as I say, they do have it in kids, uh, quite commonly had been seen, but now it's also emerging in adults as well. All right, thank you so much, Gwen. This will conclude our open Q&A session for today's webinar. If we did not have time for your question today, or if you have a question you'd like to bring us offline, you may email us at education at <clears throat> Thank you, Gwen, once again for joining us today and sharing your insight, expertise, and personal experience on adult onset food allergy. In case you missed any portion of the presentation, today's webinar will be recorded and available as a resource on FAIR's website in the coming days. After this webinar and in your post-webinar follow-up email from FAIR, a short survey link will be included for you to share feedback and to provide comments on webinar topics you'd like to see in the future. If you could, please take a moment to complete this and help us continue to deliver meaningful information to you. All affairs, resources, education programs, and a number of research efforts discussed today are made possible through community support. If you'd like to make a tax-deductible gift to Enables FAIR's mission efforts or become a FAIR member, you can do so at foodallergy.org donate. 
Next month, we will be joined by Jim Long, former senior attorney for the Office for Civil Rights, U.S. Department of Education, Denver Enforcement Office. Since the ADA Amendments Act of 2008, school districts have been struggling to come to grips with conditions that formerly were not considered dis disabilities. For example, episodic conditions like severe allergies. Jim will discuss how to help a school district understand and fulfill its responsibilities to students with severe allergies that may constitute disabilities. Priority registration for FAIR members will open Wednesday, January 27th, with general registration opening Monday, February 1st. This will conclude today's webinar. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again next month.